Mental illness has no favorite locale. Wherever there are people, wherever there is stress, wherever there are problems to solve, facts to face, there too we find mental illness. Today we are well, we travel, we work. We are serious, we are gay, we hate, we love. But some of us carry with us, always, everywhere, the possibility of breakdown, of emotional collapse. Behind the latest trend in psychiatry is the concept that wherever there are people, whether in cities or in towns, there should be appropriate facilities for taking care of their mental health, and when necessary, for helping them to recover from mental illness. This affliction should be treated as most other disease is treated, locally, without long journeys away from the communities in which we feel at home, or from the families who care about us. When psychiatric care is at hand, many cases can be found and treated early, so that they don't become serious enough to require hospital care. Mental health clinics are designed to help people at the first sign of trouble. These are often neighborhood institutions, easily accessible to ordinary families and supported by local funds, sometimes, as in New York, with the guidance and financial assistance of the state. More and more, local doctors, school officials, judges, clergymen, and other professionals are recommending their use for children and adults. More and more, the ordinary person, once afraid of psychiatry, is beginning to take advantage of their services. After all, there is nothing frightening or upsetting about coming to such an office. In this particular case, little Polly has been having trouble with her eating and sleeping patterns for several months. The family doctor could find nothing physically wrong and suggested that Mrs. Craven make an appointment at the clinic. So today, Polly will be seen by a psychiatrist. She may be counseled right off and sent home, or she may be asked to come in once or twice a week for regular treatment, as many of the patients do. Sometimes therapy requires many months, and the patient gets quite used to this waiting room. The clinic is much like any other medical office, except that it is operated on a team principle. The little girl's mother will be seen today by the psychiatric social worker, who works along with the psychiatrist and the psychologist. Often in the treatment of small children, Play therapy is the most effective form of communication between doctor and patient. Jimmy cannot tell Dr. Silberstein in words how he feels about his baby brother. But in playing with a baby doll, he shows the affection that he has learnt from his parents, as well as his resentment at being displaced as a center of family interest. The doctor, trained in interpreting this language of make-believe, sooner or later may be able to help Jim understand that his brother is no more threatening to him than the doll and then Jimmy's symptoms may disappear. The social worker begins by trying to get a true picture of the environment in which the patient lives. Do the Cravens get along fairly well? Was Polly a good eater before she started to go to school? Sometimes the answers come easily. Other times, they are masked in evasion or false pride. It is not always comfortable to see ourselves clearly. The highest level of team functioning is the staff conference. Psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and special therapists meet together regularly to discuss cases that present special problems or that reveal new and interesting material that may lead to new methods. This is an important professional opportunity for the exchange of facts and techniques and a way of tying together the different levels of mental health work in the community. The clinic also acts as a source of mental health education for the entire area in which it operates. The psychiatrist is talking to teachers from the local high school and the nearby school of nursing about the emotional problems of late adolescence. Such insight may help a teacher help a troubled student, and so the clinic's work may reach families in the town who do not even know it exists. This is preventive psychiatry. And so the mental health clinic down the street or just across town is the first link in the chain of interlocking services that can reduce the suffering caused by mental illness. And today, even when mental patients must be given 24-hour care, many of them never leave their own town or their own neighborhood. 
for a new local service is now available in many communities for the treatment of more serious forms of mental illness. Here is the Montefiore General Hospital. This is where the people of the West Bronx come when they are sick, when they have a baby, or when they need an operation. Its corridors, although hushed, bustle with activity of a big, busy, familiar institution, peopled with doctors and nurses, with visitors, with technicians. Such a building is staffed by many different kinds of specialists, all dedicated to the relief of pain, to the cure of physical suffering, to the battle against disease. This, for instance, is the pediatrics division, where doctors and nurses are skilled in the handling of sick children. But here, on another floor, looking almost exactly like the pediatric section, is a psychiatric division, where the doctors and nurses are trained in the handling of mental illness. Many experimental features of this particular psychiatric service are new and unconventional. For instance, staff members, like the nurse making the bed, do not wear hospital uniforms. And the rooms in this section were planned especially for ambulatory patients. They look like attractive sitting rooms. The beds become sofas and are pleasant to sit and read in during the day. There are cleverly designed desks at which the patients can write letters. This is a far cry from what we think of when we say mental hospital ward. And yet, seriously sick patients are under treatment in this unit. Some of them are encouraged to help the nurses with the chores, so that their own self-respect is not destroyed by the hospital experience. In a unit like this, treatment is quite intensive. Few patients need to stay in such a unit for more than a few months. Here, too, the psychiatrist is head of a team that includes psychologists, social workers, nurses, and special therapists. Occupational therapy provides the opportunity to concentrate on something outside oneself, to work, to be creative, important in redeveloping a personality that has been shattered. It's not always easy to find something that the patient will attempt. The occupational therapist tries to help the patient overcome her feelings that she is doomed to fail in everything she tries. Each little achievement builds the confidence in the patient that enables her to go on to a more difficult task. This is a picture of a mind on the mend. Another experimental feature at Montefiore is the practice of staff and patients eating together. The unit is completely open and accessible to the community. The telephone is available both for incoming and outgoing calls. Far from being shut up or exiled, the patients are even encouraged to take advantage of the social facilities available in the community that surrounds the hospital. And the community is carefully studied in a hospital research project, the epidemiology of mental illness. What parts of the community suffer the most cases of mental disease? What other agencies in the community can be integrated into a prevention campaign? These are all plotted and organized for closer study. But the role of psychiatry in a general hospital goes far beyond its own wards and its own patients. Here, for instance, a group of medical residents and interns take part in a study of psychosomatic medicine, carried on with the cooperation of the psychiatry department. They're watching a closed circuit television demonstration with their professor of medicine. The patient they are seeing is in another room, being examined by a psychiatrist, who has a special skill in getting him to talk about his feelings. For two weeks, this man had to be under anesthesia, while his windpipe was kept open because of a severe case of tetanus poisoning. How has he come through the ordeal? Did he dream? Was he aware of what was going on? Does he have any idea of how close he came to dying? The doctors can discuss the interview in their own room while it is in progress. Later, they will join with the psychiatrist to discuss the implications of the patient's answers. Learning about the emotions of the people they treat will make them better physicians and surgeons. It will also enable them to make better use of the psychiatrists on the hospital staff. For example, here we are back again in the pediatrics division. A youngster who has been treated for a serious gastric disorder is now recovering, but is beginning to show signs of intense anxiety. And so the pediatrician has called in a staff psychiatrist for consultation. 
Since the patient is already in the hospital, the interview can be arranged on a routine basis without any fuss and without frightening the child. In a hospital, you get used to talking to doctors, and this doctor is trained to talk with children. It is said that there is a psychosomatic pattern in a large percentage of all hospital cases. Often the removal of the physical symptoms may show up more basic problems. But no general hospital can operate an effective psychiatric service without a strong outpatient department. Here, help is available before or after hospitalization. In some cases, such treatment may make hospitalization unnecessary. And so, in many communities, the general hospital has become another link in the chain of comprehensive mental health care. Here is a dramatic example of what can happen today, of what is new in the treatment of mental illness. Mrs. Coleman, who had a serious breakdown four weeks ago, is now returning to her home in quite good shape. Her son, who came to take her home, does not even call a cab, because they happen to live right down the street. Years ago, for a similar ailment, this woman might have been sent away to a distant mental hospital, separated from her family and friends, and probably branded as a person who had to be locked up and removed from society. Her recovery might have been postponed for years or forever. But Mrs. Coleman never left her home community, her family, or those friends she wanted to see. The way back is easier if the way out was not long or painful. There will always be some short-term patients, however, who will require the environment of the specialized mental hospital. And of course, it is the only type of facility providing long-term care. But even state hospitals, where such cases are sent, are a far cry from the remote and mysterious institutions they used to be. This is the Hudson River State Hospital at Poughkeepsie, New York. The patient at the left, Mary Kay, has been assigned to a special unit which serves people from her county and hence operates as a community hospital within the framework of the larger institution. She is very upset at the moment, depressed, withdrawn, unable to make decisions. But under the new policy, she is already being given intensive treatment. For a mental disease like any other can be treated most effectively in its early stages. And it is now known that unnecessarily prolonged hospitalization can actually increase the patient's disability. But even for people as sick as Mary Kay, Nowadays, the average stay of patients in such a hospital is only five months. In the first week of her arrival, she moves freely about the grounds. She has friends. She is in a treatment program. She knows someone cares about her. We asked Dr. Robert Hunt, director of the Hudson River State Hospital, if there had been significant changes here in the last decade. Yes, uh, particularly the past five years. Uh, many new developments have contributed to this. Um, uh, unquestionably, there has been great improvement in our tools for specific medical treatment. The so-called tranquilizer drugs have made a great contribution uh, to controlling of symptoms of the seriously ill. We have also uh, improved all of our older tools. We make much greater use these days of occupational therapy, of psychotherapy. We do a better job of training our personnel. The total treatment program has advanced. Some of us feel that the most striking new development, the most exciting, is the open hospital. For this is an open hospital, even though it was built under now obsolete theories of total security. But locks can be left unlocked, keys can be thrown away, we can let light in. A visit to a modern mental hospital is apt to be surprising to most of us. This is actually the reception ward in a crowded hospital. It has everything that we expect to see in a hospital ward, except that there are no patients in sight. Where are they? We should have to ask the nurse in charge. For at 11 in the morning, her patients are apt to be scattered over a large area, all supposedly doing something that will help them get better. Some may be taking physical exercise somewhere on the 2,000 acres of well-equipped grounds. Others may be in the combination sitting recreation halls they call day rooms, waiting for the drug dispensing cart. For today, most mental hospital patients receive some sort of chemical medication. The general public through newspapers and magazines has heard a good deal about tranquilizer pills. 
But there are also combinations called energizers for the depressed patients, and many other drugs that free or inhibit glandular action or affect the emotional balance of the patient in some other way. The physical reactions of the patients under chemical treatment must be carefully checked. Every individual does not react the same to a given drug. Blood pressure is one of the important checkpoints. And the total physical health of the hospital population is constantly under observation. A psychiatrist is assigned to each patient and directs his treatment program, which usually includes individual psychotherapy. Did you used to feel that it was very bad to express anger with you? I probably did. Did anybody ever walk out on you if you had a temper tantrum? Well, gee, that's one thing I've ever had, you know, with somebody who's interested in my feelings. Well, it's important for everybody to have, and I am interested. And then I was so wrapped up with being a baby myself. I mean, I was thinking, you know, I'd, uh, my father would make my, my mother's breakfast in the morning, and sometimes I'd think, supposing I get up real early and make my mother's breakfast, but oh, no, Laura had to stay in bed and sleep and wait for somebody to get her up. Mm -mm. Why do you think you wanted to be still the baby? I guess I wanted my attention, too. She was getting her attention for beside us. I wanted mine, too. I didn't feel like being somebody's little slavey. You sort of feel that the only way you really get attention for yourself is if you're babyish? I guess so. Group psychotherapy, increasingly used, offers the added benefit of group interactions and permits the staff to be in direct contact with a larger number of patients than they could see individually. Mary Kay may be helped to learn about herself from insight into the behavior of her fellow patients. Often it is comforting to know that one's fears and problems are shared by others. Members of the group provide mutual understanding and emotional support. Electroshock therapy is administered to some of the patients who do not respond to other forms of treatment. Mary Kay also takes part in the occupational therapy that is part of the hospital's total program. Sewing provides a relaxing routine pattern of action. Many other activities are planned to provide stimulation or a constructive outlet for excess energy. Occupational therapy is especially helpful to older patients who are no longer able to busy themselves with the kind of work that they are used to and must learn new ways of interesting themselves in life. Some, whose nervous systems have been impaired, must relearn the once automatic finger movements that are used in handling such familiar objects as door catches and hardware gadgets. Buttons, fasteners, laces have become frustrating problems. Stiff muscles must be retrained. Clumsy joints must be given practice. It is a long, hard process. Milieu therapy is the name given to good human relations between hospital personnel and patients, now recognized as an important element in treatment and rehabilitation. In games and relaxed give and take, there is a constant opportunity for healthy emotional exchange. Therapy can be education in taking yourself less seriously, in laughing and taking life easy. And this lesson cannot be learned in an atmosphere that is grim and depressing. Relaxation can be found in sport as well. This hospital is fortunate to be situated on the banks of the Hudson River, and so the patients are able to go fishing once in a while. The nurse in such a situation is a healthy model that can be identified with and imitated. Her acceptance, respect, her very normalcy all help the patient in subtle ways. Many young women are now attracted to psychiatric nursing partly because of the opportunity it offers for making a deeply satisfying contribution to other human beings. You just have to have a real feeling for this type of work, otherwise you're worthless. I remember one person in particular was crying a lot, and uh, I had gotten to know her very well. I knew her problems, and just seeing her cry like that was something that I hadn't seen in so long, although they told me that she was very depressed. Just seeing her cry almost made me cry, and so I had to leave. After a while, I got to think of it. The young student in the hospital's own school of nursing still has much to learn about psychiatric nursing. But one can already see the personal interest and feelings that can spark a career. The wardrobe, as it is called here at Hudson River, is an example of what happens when hospital administrators recognize the need of patients to maintain their dignity and self-respect. 
It is simply a method of distributing clothing to patients. But instead of issuing garments army style, a pleasant store has been set up where patients spend their so-called clothing allowance. They can express themselves to a certain degree and thus develop some confidence in their own taste and judgment. These clothes, supplementing those provided by the hospital, were collected and repaired by volunteer women from neighboring towns. They also operate the store and thus forge another link between the patient and the community. The operation of a modern beauty salon in the hospital is another small but important way to bolster self-respect and confidence. An interest in how one looks is a first step in re-establishing social relationships, both inside and outside the hospital. And many of the patients in this hospital do meet people outside, for many of them have permission to make daytime trips to the nearby city of Poughkeepsie. From the public bus stop on the hospital grounds, they ride through suburbs into the shopping center. It is surprising how a few hours of pleasant sightseeing or just a little shopping expedition can strengthen the feeling that they are not cut off from the normal world because of their illness. These trips are part of the two-way traffic that modern psychiatry is trying to foster. The community is coming closer to the hospital and the hospital is moving nearer to the community. Another aspect of the trend to prevent patients from feeling that they have been exiled is the encouragement of visits by the families and friends of the patients. Everything that can be done by hospital officials, including setting up convenient hours and reception facilities that are pleasant and private, is done to stimulate frequent visits. For spending a few hours with familiar faces is another proof that you are not cut off and forgotten by the world that you have come from and hope to return to. State hospitals are now being built close to communities to shorten the distance between treatment and home. The hospital has some community aspects of its own, churches, the much used library, and a community store for buying little odds and ends to make hospital life a little more cheerful. Here the patients can meet informally with friends. It's another aspect of providing an easy, relaxed atmosphere to promote socialization and furthering a normal way of life. Mary Kay is beginning to show the results of treatment in this environment. Surrounded by people she has come to know and like, encouraged by friendly, interested personnel, she is responding to treatment. No longer the frightened, anxious, miserable person we saw earlier. Today she can let down the protective barriers she was hiding behind two months ago. Now she can smile and be moved by the feelings of others. Dr. Hunt told me he believed she will be sent home this weekend even though she is not completely recovered from her breakdown, as he put it. We don't have to keep people until they are well, provided treatment is available in the community after discharge from the hospital. For the hospital, we remember, is but another link in the overall chain of care which the state provides to prevent and treat mental illness. The rehabilitation of the patient may be begun here, but it is better to continue the process in the community where other specialized facilities are now available. And so today, in any one of our communities, big and small, we can meet citizens who have just come back from a mental hospital. We cannot always recognize them by their appearance or their manner in a crowded street. John G. seems to behave like everyone else, but he is not shopping or going to work this morning. He is still officially a patient of the New York State Hospital System and he is on his way to be served by one of its most interesting facilities, an aftercare clinic. It is located here in a downtown office building in the heart of the metropolitan community, 15 minutes by subway from John's home. Every Friday morning there is a welcoming session for local residents who return during the week from state mental hospitals. John was hospitalized for six months, but some of the people here this morning have been away from home and work for many years. I'd like to welcome you all to Brooklyn Aftercare Clinic. Uh, we know how glad you are to be home from the hospital. And we're here to help you in your adjustment back with your home, your friends, and your job. You'll be coming in from time to time for appointments uh, so that we can help you with things that come up. These appointments will be about once a month. Uh, the clinic is open from 9 to 5 and one evening a week. We hope you'll be able to make arrangements to come in during the day. We know some of you who are working won't be able to get the time off. And if this is the case, we'd be glad to arrange an evening appointment for you. 
I'm sure you'll all be glad to hear that anything that you tell us is held in strict confidence. I'd like to introduce you to the social workers. Uh, this is Mr. Jones. And this is Mrs. Polish. Mr. Gro your worker is Mrs. Polish. Well, I tell you, Mrs. Polish, I feel very well since I came out of the hospital Good. after I had those treatments. But I still uh, have a little doubt uh, in myself, but not much. But I feel that things will be much better now. In the course of the next year, John will come to know Mrs. Polish quite well. She will be someone to turn to in time of trouble, someone to help him maintain the gains he made in the hospital. The director of the New York City Aftercare Clinics is Dr. Donald Carmichael. We found over the years that uh, uh, this early period when a person has come back home from the hospital at the time when they're most vulnerable to uh, relapse, and so that we concentrate our attention uh, in this early phase. Once a month, the aftercare patients see a psychiatrist. Most of the time, the visit is a routine checkup, such as a former heart patient might get. But if some psychotherapeutic help is needed, the doctor gives it. Often, these visits eliminate a return to the hospital by providing a little support when it is needed. The clinic is open from 9 to 5, and patients and former patients are free to come for help at any time. Some of them, who are under a treatment routine that requires the continuing use of drugs, may come in just to get their medicine if they cannot afford to buy it themselves. The pills are dispensed by the nurse in charge of the pharmacy, who fills prescriptions written by a psychiatrist. If there was no clinic, such patients would not be able to get the medication they need and would probably have to be re-hospitalized. But some of the people who come to the clinic are no longer carried on its official roles. This man was discharged about a year ago. He has little trouble, however, in arranging to get an appointment with a psychiatrist who was once in charge of his case. I was discharged about four months ago from the clinic. Remember I used to come and see you? Uh, I remember you. Up until about three weeks ago, I was doing all right. And all of a sudden, I... I find that I can't do it. I, I can't do it anymore. I don't feel like I'm able to, to uh, keep up the pace. I, I sometimes feel now like maybe I have to go back to the hospital again. Tell me, did the symptoms bother you mostly on the job or also at home? Well, I've been feeling it at home, but uh, mostly it happens while I'm at work. Though. I mean, I, I start to feel tense while, while I'm at work. And, and this tension just upsets me. Yep, it upsets me at home. I argue with my wife and get, get upset with my child. From talking with you, your thinking is very clear. I don't think you need to go back to the hospital, but I do think uh, you could use some help at this point. Right here and then, an appointment is made for the first of the therapy sessions that will keep this man at home and on the job. But after care, must service the total community that is composed of many kinds of people. That is why the caseworkers from the aftercare center can be found sometimes in streets like these, far from their office. For when the discharged patients do not come in for checkup and help, they must find out why. It's another part of a comprehensive program of care that aims to reduce the incidence and recurrence of mental illness by being thorough. The worker is glad to hear that the mother has been well enough to resume her duties in the family and that there are no complications. When she comes in for an examination, the psychiatrist will probably discharge her from the center's roles. But it is wise to keep in touch. Relapse is a possibility. However, we have something that is even more unique than uh, aftercare clinics themselves, at least in this country and particularly in this uh, aftercare field that we have connected with this particular clinic, a day center, uh, which has been operating now about four years. Uh, this is a program that's five days a week from 9.30 to 4.30. It's something like going to work, but uh, it has different elements besides work. You'll have an opportunity to try out some kinds of work here, uh, but you'll also have an opportunity for some group therapy. Then you'll be seeing the doctor individually also. 
Many of the patients at the day hospital are seen by a psychiatrist two or three times a week. I just don't get along at home because my mother doesn't understand me. And sometimes I don't understand her. What was the difficulty you had with your father some weeks ago you were telling me about? Like, if I come in about five minutes late, they'll start yelling at me. And it all Sometimes an ex-patient's family is a big problem in the readjustment process. But the key to the program of the day hospital is the instruction of patients in the skills that they need for a living. Many girls and women are trained in the simple homemaking arts, learning to handle equipment, learning basic routines. Some of the patients who have been hospitalized for a long time never did know how to carry out the simple tasks that they will now need in the homes they are returning to. Others try to pick up the skills that are required for better jobs available in their local community. They must learn to perform up to professional standards. One of the interesting aspects of this program is the way the various staff members, social workers, nurses, therapists, cooperate as a team in working with the patients. It reflects the nature of the program, which is a strange mixture of psychiatric care and practical education. Even in an activity like a music lesson, when the young man thinks he is learning notes, he is also being trained in coordination and discipline. Most important, he is learning to overcome his fears and his lack of self-confidence. Much of the work in the rehabilitation unit seems at first like occupational therapy but actually it is developed on lines more related to vocational rehabilitation. Different crafts are tried and different tools are used by the same patient. But once a special aptitude for one is shown, the patient begins to work intensively in that field. Many different kinds of machines are required for a program like this. And after the patient has acquired sufficient skill, they are allowed to use them freely, under competent supervision, of course. Once a patient begins to feel he is competent to exercise a skill, he begins to think about the possibility of getting a paying job. Often he would like the center to find him one. But as the vocational consultant explains, that is not the province of the clinic. Or would they get a job for me? Well, nobody can actually get a job for somebody else. What they can do is to help the person to get a job for himself. I understand. What they can do is put you pretty much in a position of making the opening contact, but the actual selling is one that's done by both what you can do and your presentation to yourself. In a big commercial center like a city, the greatest possibility for employment is in clerical jobs. And so this particular unit specializes in teaching office work to those patients who can adapt themselves to its disciplines. Typing, of course, is a basic skill in this field and involves a minimum of what might be difficult interpersonal relations for some patients. Instruction is also provided in mimeographing and the use of other copying devices. Some patients are taught to make use of dictating machines that are now standard equipment in most business offices. Even adding machines are available for practice in minor bookkeeping problems. This man has actually never worked in his life and the opportunity to learn a simple task may enable him to earn his own living and stay out of an institution. On the other hand, some patients are relearning skills that they once had and then lost. Jack Z, for instance, has been attending the day center for six months after many years of hospitalization. The full staff meets to discuss his future. He himself is part of the group that will determine the possibility of his discharge. And you live at home, well? Uh, I live at home, my mother, father. Mother, father. Any brothers? I'm the only child. The only child. Any problems at home? I don't have any problems at home. My mother's well satisfied on being occupied. She didn't like, when I first was released from the house, I didn't have nothing to do but look for a job all day, and I didn't find a job. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in school all day, she likes that. She likes the idea I'm learning, and I might have a chance to get a job through the center. 
You've never lived away from home except when you were in the army, right? Except when I was in the Coast Guard. Is that something you want to continue? Yes. How would you feel about living alone? Take an apartment on your own, let's say. I'd like that too if it was necessary, but right now it's not necessary. What do you want? I like living with my parents. I get along with them very well. The other members of your family have married and moved no, out, right? That's right. They're all married and they all have their own apartments. They all have children. They're all married. You mentioned that you were the only child. You meant the only child at home? Only child at home. There's four, four children, including myself. Jack will probably be encouraged to find a job now. For the center's function is to encourage the patient's complete return to the community. For here in the business of life is the beginning and end of psychiatric care. Here in the ebb and flow of community action. That is why so many different community agencies must join together in a combined effort to fight mental illness. It is why psychiatrists and their teams are now trained so that they know what is going on in the whole field of psychiatry, whether they work as private physicians or in a clinic or in a hospital. They learn how to dovetail their services, how to complement each other's skills, how to provide the continuous chain of care so that a disturbed adolescent can be treated early in a neighborhood clinic. And an old woman who cannot face the reality of her husband's death can be cared for in the local hospital. Different treatment is required for the young woman who has been in and out of institutions ever since childhood. Or for the older man who substitutes imagined triumphs for his failures in real life. And different treatments when nervous systems have been destroyed by disease. But mental illness does respond to treatment. And tomorrow the appropriate treatment will be available where and when and how it is needed. As the chain grows longer and more complete. That is the new goal of psychiatry. <laughs>